Good morning. morning. Welcome to Grace Church on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. A little bit cooler than last week. Praise God for that. Uh, Let's begin with now that the daylight fills the skies. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Hosea, in the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. In out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went away from me. They kept sacrificing to the balls in offering incense to idols. Yet, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, 
with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give up Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you Adama? How can I treat you like Zebo Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord, who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trem trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. I will return to them their homes, says the Lord. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is a portion of Psalm 107. We'll say it responsibly by half verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim. He gathered them out of the lands. Some wandered in desert wastes. They were hungry and thirsty. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He put their feet on a straight path. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy. For he satisfies the thirsty. Whoever is wise will ponder these things. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must rid yourself of such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is in all and is all and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stand together for Father, we thank thee.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. You bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ, holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, again, good morning. It's good to see uh, some of you first time, second time, some of you 147,000th time. It's good to have you all here, not sweating as much, uh, slightly comfortable. Um, this last week, I was thinking about uh, a bumper sticker uh, from the 1980s. So a couple of you may remember this. It was my dad's favorite bumper sticker. My dad was born in 1940, so he's in some age range of, of some of you, and he passed away in 94, but in the 80s, I remember multiple times, whenever he saw it, and I don't know how many people had it, he loved the bumper sticker, the man who dies with the most toys wins. Very 80s, right? All this money, what are we gonna do with it? Buy toys. I looked it up this last week because I never really was sure. Uh, apparently it's attributed to Malcolm Forbes, the scion of the Forbes family who began the magazine. And as you might guess, Mr. Forbes is not poor. And so of course for somebody who is ultra wealthy, that's a great phrase. Got to get all the toys and then I die, I win, right? My dad and uh, our family were, were comfortably middle class, so I think for my dad it was kind of twofold. One, it was, boy, I really like toys. My dad loved cars and trains and computers, and he died right before computers got really awesome. He would have loved it. He loved tinkering and all of that. So I think he loved that aspect of, I could get toys. I also think that within his heart was that whole idea, like, wouldn't it be nice to have all the money you need to buy the toys? But this whole idea raises a couple questions, this, this bumper sticker. The man who dies with the most toys wins. And I, it could be woman as well, but I'm just going with what I saw. Raises a couple questions. In order for you to have all the toys to win, where do you get the toys? You gotta have all the money. And the question is, how many do you need? How much do you really need and want in the world to get all the toys with all the money? How much do we as human beings really need? And is that winning? But the implication in the bumper sticker and by you know, connection to Malcolm Forbes, what he's saying is he dies and he wins. So is this the only life? And is it really about getting as much stuff as we can get? It would seem that Malcolm Forbes would suggest yes. Don't have to worry about anything. Once I die, I've won. Got all the toys. That's all it's about. Raises some interesting questions for us as Christians, doesn't it? Some of you I've mentioned before uh, may know that one of my favorite TV shows, and, and maybe some of you have seen this or heard of it, if you don't watch TV, God love you. I wish I could do that. Um, American Pickers, it's a show on History Channel. And if you don't know what a picker is, uh, some of you might be pickers, um, an amateur picker. A picker is somebody who goes randomly, or actually in the show, they start calling houses. 
You go to houses or barns or schools or old places and you pick through their house and you get old junk or what they like to call treasure and you basically refurbish it and sell it to somebody as an antique or as a tool or whatever else. And so the American pickers go across the country, these two guys who've known each other forever and great banter, fun stories, uh, and they go to people's places and they go through their multiple places and they go, oh, this is great, I will sell this. Motorcycles and antiques and cars and trinkets and all this fun stuff. And I love it. Some of you are like, that sounds really terrible. And that's what my wife says to me every time. Why are you watching this? It's a show about a bunch of old stuff. I like old stuff, right? I love it. I love learning about the history of these antiques. I love learning about the price because are you the one like me who like goes into the, the, the Goodwill store or maybe the antique store and you're like, $4? That's worth like 100 right? Some of you may have done that. You got the Goodwill painting for $10. You've seen Antiques Roadshow. $20,000. I'm still waiting for it to happen. But I love that kind of sense of adventure and, and I love antiques and the history. It just, I love it. But underlying the fun of that aspect is the psychology that I have learned about the people that they are picking. You see, when they go to these places, more often than not, these people that they go to see have a room or a garage or a house floor or the whole house or two houses or two houses in a barn or a house, a barn, and 17 buildings filled with stuff or junk, or as they like to refer, rusty gold. Isn't that a nice way to say junk? Rusty gold. Now before we go any further, this is not judgment. I have way too much stuff and junk and I love collecting things. So if any of you feel today like I'm judging you because you have a room or a house or three houses or seven barns filled with stuff, it's not a judgment, not really. As we heard in the, the psalm today, these are things to ponder. And my hope today is that by hearing and seeing what Jesus suggests in relation to, do we really need all this stuff and is this the only life, that you will come to the conclusion that perhaps, hmm, we'll see what happens. So these people who have all this stuff, right? Lots of junk, but maybe a golden treasure here and there. What's more interesting beyond that is the pre and post story, because a lot of these people call the pickers, one, they want to be on TV, of course, but because they're retiring or about to die or their parents or grandparents or cousin or friend died. And now, guess whose stuff is a problem? It's somebody else's problem. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. My mom told us 10 years ago, I'm going to spend all of my money so that you don't fight over it. She did that. She's still alive, but there's no money, so we're not going to fight. And there's not much left in the house, so we're not going to fight. But you know what it is. You collect these things, you have these collections, you have this stuff, you have this junk, maybe stuff you don't need. And guess what? When you get older, you're like, now what do I do with all this stuff? And your children are like, I don't want any of that stuff. I hope that's the Holy Spirit. Um, so what do you do with it? You gotta give it away to somebody. And most of people in younger generations don't want any of the stuff, the antiques, the golden treasures. And so these stories are about people like, oh, pickers, help us. We don't know what to do with all this stuff. And you see real quickly how the problem, and it is a problem, that we collect these things in life, and when we die, guess what? We move the problem onto somebody who doesn't have our problem, they have a new problem. They don't want that stuff. And so now the problem has shifted to somebody else. And yet even under that, there is one other interesting thing. As you hear these people's story uh, of all this stuff that they collect, they tell you the reasons they've collected it. Some of you can nod your head and agree. I just had to have it. I couldn't not buy it. I didn't want that antique to go to the trash. I didn't want history to be destroyed or one of my favorites, the completist. Do we have any completists here? Do you know what a completist is? A completist is somebody who has a collection and they have to have everything in the collection. So an easy one is comic books. They have every comic book from one to 200. 
They did a show with a guy who has, or as he says, about every single kind of lunchbox that was ever made in the 50s. He's like, I'm a completist. I have to have every one of them. Quick question, who needs 400 lunchboxes, right? And as you hear these stories, you begin to suggest something in your own brain because we all collect, all of us, whether you like to admit or not, some too much, some a little bit, whatever. I have a matchbook collection. Do I need that? No, they're very cool. Did I waste money? Probably. But why do we do it? Why do we have collections? Why do we fill rooms and buildings with stuff? And you hear these people and you start to begin to realize something. A lot of them allude to it. Some of them say it straight out. It makes me feel like I'm young again. I like to stand in the room and just look. And you can see it on their faces. Why do they have all that stuff? Because it fills some hole inside of who they are. It gives them joy or peace or contentment to have stuff. For some reason, there's something lacking in their life. Whether for a lot of these people it was, I didn't have it as a child, now I have to have all of it. There's a lot of those. These people, especially men, who were like, I have to have every toy ever because when I was a child, I had a can with a string on it. And now I have money, so I'm gonna buy every toy ever made when I was a child. But what are they really doing? They're filling a hole in their soul. When we do that, we're filling a hole. The problem with that is, as also revealed in the show, is what? We fill a hole by buying all this stuff and then we die, and guess whose problem it is now? Your children, or your grandchildren, or your neighbor. And they don't have the same hole that needs to be filled, so what do they do with all this stuff? What do you do with it? Call the American Pickers. See, that's one of the problems with this whole picture is we buy things in immediate gratification. We live as human beings in the moment. You all have done this, so don't feel guilty because we've all done it. You're at the store, whatever store it is. Oh, I need that healthy something something. I'm gonna get in shape. Ooh, that dress is 50% off. I need it. You're in the antique store. That whatchamacallit, oh, it's 10% off. I need it. So you buy it in the moment. And then what happens? You get home, the food goes in the pantry. You find it three years later. The dress, you hang up in front of a mirror three or four days later or a week later and you're like, oh, actually that's terrible. The whatchamacallit doesn't go with your decor, is a piece of junk, why did you buy it? You see, we don't think more often than not long term. We don't think about all this stuff that we have for whatever reason we have it, for whatever hole it's filling, what about down the road? You see where I'm going with this? Back to those questions. How much stuff do we really need and want in our lives? And is this the only life in which we can win by collecting all that or not? This is that bumper sticker. And today, I believe that Jesus speaks to both of these problems, these quandaries, in our passage from Luke 12. He speaks to these questions of, do we need all this? And is this the only life? Now you have to see the setup because it's really interesting how the story begins. I suggest later today or this week, you maybe go through Luke chapter 12 and read right before this passage what happens. What's Jesus doing? He's doing what Jesus does. He's talking about the kingdom. He's talking about God. He's talking about himself as the son of man in reference to the Messiah. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about angels. Is he talking about rusty junk? Is he talking about stuff? He's no, he's talking about heavenly things, godly things. This is, this is the foretaste of the conversation. And in the midst of that conversation where he's like God, Holy Spirit, angels, son of man, kingdom, walks a man who comes up in the midst of the crowd and goes, Hey, could you get me some stuff? I mean, that's not what he says, but that's really what he means. Hey, Rabbi, can you help me get my brother's inheritance or split it? What is an inheritance? I'm not getting one, so I don't know. Some of you know, though. What is it? Money, property, and stuff. Is that bad? No, I'm not saying it's bad. But this man has just basically heard Jesus talking about eternal life, kingdom of heaven, angels, and the Holy Spirit. And what's he want? He wants stuff. 
hey, I hear what you're, hey, by the way, can I have some stuff? And I imagine, I have to imagine, this is me emoting into the story, which is always dangerous for a pastor to do. I imagine there was a pregnant pause, and I use that because it makes a lot of sense. I imagine there was this like moment where Jesus was just like, and God rolled his eyes, you people. And that's all of us, by the way. Really? Did you not hear? Okay, fine. First off, I'm not here to get you stuff. That's what Jesus says. I'm not the arbitrator. I'm not helping you get stuff. Yes, some of the rabbis probably did that, but Jesus is like, did you listen? Clearly not. But Jesus never wanted to miss an opportunity. He's like, but while I've got you, and everybody else is here listening, remember that we talked about this a few weeks ago, if I'm gonna tell a story to one person, I may as well kind of emote it so everybody else can learn. Let me tell you a story. By the way, I'm gonna start off with full force and power. Be aware that life is not about an abundance of possessions. You notice how he's not like, let's have some tea and talk about what you like to collect. No, be aware of the greed of abundance of possessions. And he uses that word greed in particular. Paul uses it today in his writing. And this word greed biblically is very interesting. When I say the word greed, of course none of you or I think us. What do you think? You think of a movie or a book or a TV show, that slimy, greasy person who's like, I want it all, right? You think about some of the people in Willy Wonka, Augustus, who's eating all the chocolate syrup, right? I want it all. Veruca Salt, I want the world, right? Yes, there is something to that. But this word greed is really more simple biblically. What it suggests is, I want more, which all of us want, Yes, Charlie, I want more than God has already given me. This is not the greed of the worst person you know who stole everything or wanted everything in your life or took everything from you. This is the greed of the the normal human heart that is not satisfied with what God has given you. Do you remember the Garden of Eden? Do you remember Adam and Eve? The presence of God, a garden. You've got water, you've got food, you've got protection of God in the presence. And they were like, "Mm, could we have the apple? Greed. God gave them everything they needed, and they were like, no, we want more. More. And so this is how he starts the conversation. Be aware. Now, I know you're not listening. I'm not talking to you, by the way. He's talking to the guy. Hint, hint. So I'm gonna tell you a story because that's what we do. We're story people. 2,000 years, story was the way we teach. We still do, but more so then. I know you didn't just hear me, so I'm gonna move from you to the crowd, but I know you're gonna listen now. So I'll tell you a story, what we call the parable of the rich fool. This man who was rich and abundant, not just money, because he could just say rich. He didn't say just rich. He said rich and abundant. So he has money and he has stuff. And he's got so much money and stuff, he doesn't know what to do with it. He's got some barns that he can put it in, but it's not enough. And he's so rich, he's like, I'll knock down those barns, and I'll build bigger ones, and I'll put all my stuff in there. And then notice the shift in what Jesus suggests. And then I say to my soul, that's an interesting shift of language. I have some food, I got some stuff, I got some money, but my soul can now say, eat, drink, be merry, because I have everything my soul needs. You see what the man did? He went from I have a bunch of material stuff to bring it in the soul. See, it's a spiritual matter that I have stuff. Jesus is making a point. You see, every time the phrase eat, drink, and be merry is in Scripture, and it's in more times than you would suggest. Paul uses it. It's also in Isaiah, Ecclesiastes, and the wisdom of Solomon. And the underlying assumption of all of those, especially in Ecclesiastes, is God uses this phrase to push us and tease us and say, I know you think if you have stuff that you're going to be happy, like the American Pickers people, like each one of us who are like, I'm going to get the whole collection of, of communion signs at church. You know what I'm talking about. How good do you feel? when you buy that spoon or that thimble or that matchbook at the tourist attraction. (sighs) 
eat, drink, and be merry. And yet Ecclesiastes teases out the real truth of what God says. He's using it ironically. Jesus is using it ironically. Paul uses it ironically. It's not about eat, drinking, and be merry because you have all the stuff you need. It's eat, drink, and be merry because guess where you got all the stuff you have? From God. Which means you have enough. You don't need more, which means that even if it is the darkest day and your life is terrible and you hate everything, you should still eat, drink, and be merry because guess what you have? You have enough for the day that God has given you. That's all intertwined here in this discussion. But Jesus isn't done. Remember when he smacked us all and said, beware, you don't need a bunch of stuff, don't be greedy? Remember that? Now God steps in the story. He does the same thing. You fool. Do you think this is just a story, a parable? This is God speaking through Jesus in a parable to the man, to the crowd, to every future human being. We are fools, every one of us, because we think that collecting and having abundance in wealth and property and stuff will fill the deepest needs of our soul. We are fools. This is why people have to have all the stuff. This is why people keep having more power and more money. You recognize that. You know people. Maybe some of us are on that level. I need one more. Sounds like an addiction, does it? One more hit. One more antique. Just one more pair of shoes. And God says, you're a fool. So what is that great lesson underlying this? If we're reflecting back on our two questions, do we really need all this and want all this? Do we need it? And is this the only life in which we can win with all that? And the first thing Jesus says is, we're fools. He literally calls us fools. It's not very nice, but he does. He's God. He can do that. You're fools. You think having all this stuff and money and power and, and property is going to make you truly happy. It's not, he says. What will? Filling yourself with godly things. Because why? When you die, all the stuff you have accumulated doesn't go with you. If you don't believe me, go to Cairo, go to the museum, and see all of King Tutankhamun's stuff that he thought was going with him to heaven and is now in a museum. You don't take it with you. And your problem, for whatever it was, now is somebody else's problem. Jesus and God are saying, fill yourself with me. Because the stuff you're trying to fill yourself with isn't going to do it. Now, some kind of insinuations. Is it about wanting things? No, I don't think so explicitly. God created us. He knows we want things. We're like a bunch of crows, right? I want something shiny. It's okay to have nice things. But to stand before Jesus and say, hey, are you going to get me some stuff? It's a difference between wanting things and asking God for the things you want. I can't be the only person in here who bought a Mega Millions ticket last week. I didn't ask God for me to win, but I thought about it. Is God going to give me the Mega Millions because I asked him? You fool. So it's not about wanting. It's about asking God for what you want. Number two, is it about possessing things? Clearly not. Because if he didn't want us to have any possessions, thank you from uh, John and the Beatles, no possessions, we'd be sitting in a field naked right now. Thank God we're not, for a variety of reasons. Possessions are okay. He wants us to enjoy the earth and things and art and beauty and truth and wisdom. But when the things that we possess take the place of the God who created them and gave them to us, that's a problem. When my goal is to get all the toys and win instead of coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I have a problem. I have a ton of toys in my house. Owen has a ton of toys. Is he going to be happier because he has toys? Maybe for a second. Underlying all of these is a greater assumption. That when the man confronted with the living Lord Jesus Christ standing before him, and maybe he didn't know who he was. He just knew he was a rabbi who was smart. What did he ask him for? Stuff. So we go back to those questions. Do we need all this stuff that we want to need? And is this the only life worth getting it for? And I think Jesus says, absolutely, the answer to both of these. It's not the only life. I think we all should know that in the church. And clearly, beware of your greed. You're a fool. Don't collect all this stuff. It's not me saying it. I'm not judging you. I have plenty of stuff. 
I have collections that I have narrowed down over the years. So if you feel, oh my God, Charlie's picking on me today. I'm just saying what the Psalms and Christ are saying. Ponder these things. Do you need that stuff? And who's going to take care of it when you're gone? Because there's one last question that I want you to ponder and marinate in the midst of this conversation. Today, tomorrow, next week. If you have an opportunity to stand before Jesus Christ, the Lord of salvation, the incarnate God, who died on the cross for your sins, rose again to offer you eternal life, and you have an opportunity to ask him for one thing, what do you ask him for? More money? More toys? More power? More cars? Or might you dare to ask him for that one thing he came to give you? As he says in John chapter 10, I have come to give you life and life abundant. Could it be that if we ask God in Christ through the Holy Spirit for life, that those magical holes that the stuff doesn't fill in might actually go away? Could we ask Jesus for life in him? Could we? To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, will you stand with me now as we affirm our life-giving faith in the words of the Nicene Creed? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Standing, sitting, or kneeling as able, let us pray. In, we, in peace we pray to you, Lord God. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Ian and Laura, our bishops, Jeffrey, our bishop-elect, Charlie and Judy, our priests, for the Shoreline Soup Kitchen and Pantries, Common Good Gardens, Old Saverick Youth and Family Services, Early Head Start, the AA groups that meet at Grace Church, Boy Scout Troop 51, Patrick Dominguez and his church planning efforts, the Kateri Medical Services in Nigeria. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Good Shepherd in, Sel in Shelton, St. Paul's in Shelton, St. Albans in Simsbury, and for the Christ Church Cathedrals, Ministries in Hartford, the Cathedral Chapter, the Honorary Canons of our Cathedral, we pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for those in service of our country, Travis Board, Nathaniel Burnham, Todd Burroff, Tammy Morgan, Adam Rendell, 
Daniel Krautz, Tom Cote, Brandon Peace. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world for an end to racism and for peace in Ukraine and Russia and all other areas where war and hostilities are occurring. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray today for Kate, Kent, Myra, Jennifer, Lisa, Janice, Nancy, Andrea, Lucinda, Hilda, Brian, Barbara and John Zakar, Laura and Tommy Urban, Dee LaBelle, Thomas Burnham, Erlene Bell, Aurelia Knox, Sarah Craig, Joyce, Marjorie, Len Pass, Eugene Williams, James, Marguerite, Kay Hall, Frank Roman, Penny, Justin Anando, Margie, Jordan Forrest, Laura, Aaron, Bill Ross, Brian, Sandy, Emily, Ray, Cam, Nina, Ed Courtney, Kathy Auger, Valerie and Richard Beers, Coral, Kate, Mary, Doug Hamill, Honey, JJ Evola, and family, Will, Derek, Louis Cannell, Helen, Marla, Ken, Sonny, Ed, Kay O'Day, Jan Hamill, Donna Crooks, Kathy Jones, Shara Dudak, Debbie Stitch, Barbara, Elisa, Grace, Donna, Kevin, Howard, Alicia Winlowski, and family, Bethany and Ben, Diane Worley, Janet Vietz, Michael, Charlie, Amber, David, Jen, Mary Beth, Scott Gunn, Barbara Bowie, and Sylvester. Please add your own petitions, either out loud or in silence. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. We remember those who have died. Add your own petitions either out loud or in silence. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray either out loud or in silence for our own needs and those of others. enough, Lord God, that we know you. May you strengthen us in our resolve to focus on you, to follow you, to hear you, to see you, to trust you, and to seek you for what you have come to do, which is save us and to set us free from sin and temptation. Strengthen each one of us today, Lord Jesus, to ponder those questions that you ask and to find the way, the truth, and the love in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Together, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand for the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Greet one another with signs of peace. Did you turn that off? <laughs> and please be seated. Um, just a quick couple of things. One, we had our first uh, summer dinner gathering, evening prayer and music. Uh, it was a good success this last Wednesday. Thank you for all who came and brought food. We'll do it again on Wednesday, August 17th uh, outside. Uh, the church will provide an entree, water and soda or seltzer. And we ask that if you uh, come that you can bring a side or a dessert. Uh, bring an extra chair, even though we have picnic tables, but so that you can go to the music. And, uh, and bug spray if needed, which miraculously we did not need last week. I'm not sure where all the bugs went, but um, it was a great occasion to, to have fellowship. And, and I'm hoping, the church is hoping, the vestry is hoping that we can do a little bit more of this each month and get us kind of reacclimated to, oh, there are people and we can talk to each other now. Um, so we'll have some more social events coming up. For some of you who are visiting for the first or second time, just a refresher on our communion procedure. First, it is the tradition of the Episcopal Church that all baptized Christians are welcome to receive. If you don't want to receive, um, you can come up and cross your hands over your chest and I will offer you God's blessing. But if you would like to take communion, we have our, our COVID protocol communion, which is safely made uh, and put into these plastic cups. We have the whole buffet. We have regular wafers, we have regular wafers with wine, we have gluten-free wafers, and we have gluten-free wafers with wine. Uh, if that is not your cup of tea, if you uh, would like a, a more personal, uh, we have Julie and I who will stand here with actual wafers and actual wine. Uh, if you would like to receive that way, come up with one hand to receive just the wafer, two hands so that I know to dip it in the wine, and we will place it in your hand. We uh, process from the inside row here, and they will come up and go out, and then the inside row here, come up and go out. Then the outside row there will come over here and then go up. And last but not least, the outside row comes here and goes up. We have trash cans at the front and back of the church for your disposal. And I really can't wait until the day I don't have to do any of this anymore. So say some prayers. Um, I think that's it. Again, welcome. If you're new, first or second time, and we don't know who you are, feel free to fill out a, a welcome card in the pew. Let us know. We'll put you on the email list. Uh, anything from out here? Thank you, Owen. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Please stand.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Please be seated. Thank you, Lord. 
Jesus Christ, which is given for you. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you.
On page of our uh, 14 of our in-house bulletin, let us say together the prayer of spiritual communion for those who could not be with us today. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, and in this life and the life to come. Amen. And now our post-communion prayer, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. But let's stand together for our recessional hymn, Christ is the World's True Light. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.
Have a blessed week and stay cool.